We're talking this morning about the fact that Jesus died for all. He died for all our sins, didn't he? And he died for all of us, for the sins of the world, he died. Now, you don't have to look at the details on this screen, okay? We just want to get the gist of it, and that's why I used it anyway. When I was a, when I was a kid, when I was a real young person and preachers got up to preach, sometimes they would have these sheet charts. Anybody ever seen a sheet chart? We've got some, but you're, it's all of us old folks, right? <laughs> we remember those, the preachers having those. And, and they would talk about the dispensations in the Bible. Basically, three different dispensations or time periods where God communicated to people on planet Earth. And you talk, they would talk about the patriarchal age when God spoke to the, the fathers that were heads of families like uh, Abraham or Noah or Jacob, Israel, okay? That was the patriarchal age. And then, and then after crossing the Red Sea, that's supposed to be the Red Sea there, you got the Mosaic age when God made the covenant with the Israelites at Mount Sinai and gave them the law that, that's called the law of Moses, the, the Pentateuch, the Torah. And, and that's the, 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 the mosaical age in this chart. And then comes the cross where Jesus died and his blood dedicated the new covenant, the New Testament. And so we have the Christian age. You know, I, I remember this chart years ago. In fact, I used to use... The Jewel Miller charts. Anybody seen Jewel Miller charts? <laughs> Maybe you used the videos years ago in teaching someone the gospel. I used to do that. And I also had these Jewel Miller charts that, were, it, that you could fold open, and they would have all these, these different sensations, time periods that are in the Bible. And uh, years ago, I was in Minnesota living with a preacher who was also a dairy farmer, Albert Wannis and his wife Bernice. You know, that's the place where I first started preaching and I would practice on the cows. And I remember sitting, they had rocks in their pastures like you wouldn't believe. It was almost looking at, like looking at a cemetery, there were so many rocks. <laughs> and I would sit on the rock and I was preaching to the cows and they all turned around and walked away. It was a sad day. For cows. <laughs> but anyway, Albert and I would get up and have breakfast together in the morning, and we would talk about the Bible, we'd talk about different issues. Uh, he, he was a wonderful teacher, wonderful person, he and his wife both. And uh, he said, you know, we were, we were talking about this chart, he said, you know, there's something wrong with that chart. Because down here, it needs to have Gentiles. This is, this is primarily what we think of as, as Jewish history and background, right? But, but he said, that's really not true. Because the Bible is a book for people of all nations. And the word Gentiles means nations. In the Old Testament Hebrew, goyim is the Hebrew word for nations, for Gentiles. We like the variety of food choices we have in our country, don't we? I used to drive the school bus in uh, Newtown, Sarasota, Sarasota, Florida, and a lot of Jamaica people lived in that community, and I used to haul some kids that were Jamaican. And they Jamaican me crazy. <laughs> but uh, we have all kinds of food choices. I loved it when I went to China in 98, and uh, uh, we met with the Christians, and we, we, we assembled at, at a restaurant, a little mom-and-pop restaurant that was entered through an alley so that nobody could see us, because <laughs> it was against the law for us to be doing that. And anyway, after we had our worship service, then we would eat together, and I tell you, it was fantastic. And I'm going to tell you, Chinese food in China is not like American Chinese food. 
it is much better. It's like mom and pops cooking. Good stuff. And I remember one occasion we had a, 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 a various uh, items on the table, and you, and you all kind of dipped in the same bowls to get your food to put on your plate, you know, with your chopsticks. <laughs> and uh, this one day we had sheep vertebrae. How many have ever eaten sheep vertebrae? No hands? <laughs> well, let me tell you, all you did was sheep vertebrae just suck on the bones because that's all it was. But it was delicious. We love the variety, don't we? And we have all this variety of foods because in America because America is this melting pot, isn't it? It's a melting pot of Africans, English, French, Italians, Germans, Chinese, Vietnamese, Russians, and so forth. Being in a country with all these ethnic groups is a wonderful thing. It is a blessing. I mean, you can travel to other countries like when I did to China, I saw no other ethnic groups. <laughs> I saw thousands of Chinese people. That was it. And I stuck out like a sore thumb <laughs> when I was there. Because we went to a Chinese area where Westerners didn't go. That's where we were. We, we stayed in a Chinese hotel. And uh, we live in a country with such variety. Thank God for it. God produced this country that we are in. Even with all of its foibles and mistakes and problems, God produced this country that enables us to be in this congregation, people from all nations, in the family of God. And I want to tell you, America is the melting pot, but I want to tell you there, there was a, another melting pot long before us. And it's talked about in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus was speaking to his apostles after the resurrection. He said he has given, been given all authority in heaven and earth. And he said to his, his apostles, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now you make a disciple by teaching because a disciple is a follower of a teacher. So they were to teach the gospel and the result of that would be making disciples, followers of Christ, followers of the teacher and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is, they baptize people for the forgiveness of their sins, Acts 2.38. They baptize people to have their sins washed away, Acts 22, verse 16. And then they were to teach them to observe all that I commanded you, Jesus says. So the apostles were, were to teach in order to make disciples, and they were to baptize those people to become saved individuals. And then after that, they were to continue to teach them. This is our task, to teach, baptize, and teach. That's our job. That's our responsibility as preachers of the gospel. And they were to go to who? To all nations. All nations. And so Christianity... And the gospel me message was meant to, to globalize. <laughs> the apostles were given a global mission, weren't they? What did John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world. The world was in God's focus when he developed his scheme of redemption. The world was in God's focus when he sent his son to this earth. The world was in God's focus when Christ died on the cross for our sins. Jesus is a sacrifice for sins for the whole world. And 1 John talks about that. In 1 John chapter 2, John talked about Jesus being our helper, our advocate. 
with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he said in verse 2 of 1 John 2, He himself is the propitiation for our sins. That is the sacrifice to cover our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. This is the good news. For the whole Greek word is cosmos. Whole world. Talk about the word Gentile for a minute here. This is good news for the nations, the Gentiles. The English word Gentile comes from a Latin word, gens, meaning clan or tribe. In later Latin, as after the time of the apostles, gens referred to peoples who did not belong to the Roman Empire. The Roman citizens, they called anybody outside of that, they, those are the gens. And by medieval times, this word, gens, designated non-Jews and began to take on a religious meaning because, of course, Christianity was spreading throughout the Roman Empire, right? And in the King James Bible, in the Old Testament, the word Gentile occurs 30 times. In the New Testament, it occurs 101 times. Why is it 101 times in the New Testament? Because the gospel is for who? The nations, the Gentiles, all the clans or tribes of the earth. In the Old Testament, Gentiles translate the Hebrew word goyim, and sometimes it was translated nations, sometimes it's translated heathen, sometimes it's translated just people. There we go. In the King James Bible, in the New Testament, the word Gentiles is the Greek word ethnos. Of course, we, we, we hear that word when we say things like uh, ethnic festivals. Some, some cities have ethnic festivals where you get to have all kinds of different food from different countries. Ethnic cleansing goes on in the world, unfortunately. That's the Greek word for Gentiles in the New Testament. New Testament uses that word ethnos 93 times. It's translated nations. It's translated heathen in Acts 4 in the King James Bible, verse 25. It's translated people in verses uh, in the New Testament. The word Gentile was also used to translate the Greek word Helen. And Helen, if you're listening to me today on YouTube, oh, she's up here. There you are. Helen, your name's in the Bible. <laughs> That's the Greek word for Greek. The word Gentile was also used to translate the Greek word Helen. Gentiles who spoke Greek language, which a lot of people in the first century that lived in the Mediterranean area, whether you were in Spain or Italy or the Middle East, you spoke Greek. And Greek and Gentile became more or less interchangeable terms, meaning the same thing. Like in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says that the gospel was preached to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why do he say Greek? Well, that word Greek there is being used for all other people, Gentiles. It's being used that way. Well, When we study the Bible, we learn that Gentile salvation was in God's plan from the very beginning. God is the creator of all people. And his story, the Bible, is not just about Jewish people. Throughout the Bible, God demonstrated his interest in people from all nations. And you can see that when you study through the Old Testament. Think about some famous Old Testament Gentile people like Rahab at the city of Jericho. Or think about Ruth, who becomes, who becomes an, a, a, an ancestor to King David. She was a Moabite. She was not an Israelite. Uriah was what? The Hittite. 
The famous Hittite nation existed in what we call Turkey today. And Uriah was a Hittite, and probably Bathsheba was as well. The widow of Zarephath, whose son was raised from the dead. You remember that? Where was she from? She was from Sidon. She was a Syrian. How about Naaman? Who, uh, uh, Elisha goes to Naaman and, and tells him how to be healed from his leprosy. You remember that? Where was he from? He was from Syria too. In fact, he was a captain of the Syrian army. He was a Gentile. In the, in the book of Jonah, Jonah is sent to, what, to who? The Ninevites, to the Assyrians. Wow. The Old Testament is full of Gentiles that God cared about, that God showed love toward, that the Jewish people showed love towards. The Bible is full of Gentiles. Years ago, uh, I door docked in a neighborhood where some Chinese people lived because I wanted to reach Chinese with the gospel. And, and I got close with a Chinese couple, Jian and Yua Kong. And uh, when I first sat down and, and talked with him about the Bible, I said, Jian, did you know that the Bible is for Chinese people? Because it's, it's for people of all nations. It's for you, too. And he was amazed by that. <laughs> Gentile salvation was in God's plan. In Genesis 12, God picked out a Gentile named Abram, who was from Mesopotamia. He grew up in Ur of Chaldees, where the Sumerians lived there on the Euphrates River. And God promised him many descendants. God promised him land which his descendants could live in. And God said to him, through you, all families of the earth will be blessed. All families. All those tribes. All those clans of the earth will be blessed. That's the promise made to Abraham 2000 B.C. You got it? Isn't that fantastic that when you start out in the book of beginnings, Genesis, and that's what Genesis means, there you begin the story of God making promises for people of all nations that through Abraham's seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. The Apostle Paul talks about this promise made to Abraham. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In Galatians 3, Paul says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, to his descendants. And he does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. The Apostle Paul says that this seed here, in this promise in Genesis 22, and this is a chapter where, where Abraham attempted to sacrifice his son. You remember that? God restates the promise to him that he made in Genesis 12. And God says, your seed, in your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And Paul says, that was talking about Christ. Christ is the seed of Abraham to bless all nations. And then in Genesis chapter 22, again, that, that promise that was made there is spoken about by Paul in that same chapter in Galatians, further, further up in the chapter in verse 8. And listen to this, this is just fantastic. The scripture, that is the Genesis scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. God preached the gospel to Abraham 2000 B.C. Long before Jesus was ever born. And in that preaching of the gospel to Abraham, God said, all the nations will be blessed in you. This is fantastic. This is some of the evidence that shows the cohesiveness of the Bible, the unity of the Bible. This is some of the evidence that shows the inspiration of the Bible, that God, God gave us this book that we have. It came from Him. Here's a promise made 2000 B.C. that God fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And then in the New Testament, you can find all kinds of passages that talk about God was planning salvation for the Gentiles. Like 
In Romans chapter 9, Paul talks about that, that God planned to make known the riches of his mercy to Gentiles. And Paul says that was prophesied in Hosea. Go read the text of Romans chapter 9. But look at this. Again, in Romans chapter 15, Paul talks about blessings coming to Gentiles. He said, Christ fulfilled the promises given to the fathers, benefiting Jewish people and Gentiles. And, and then in Romans chapter 15, after, after verse 9, Paul quotes Old Testament scriptures. Many. Go read this text sometime. We don't have time this morning, but go read it. Because it's just fantastic. All the prophecies that were shown there that were fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross as providing blessings for people of all nations. Go read it. Because it's just fantastic, folks. Paul quotes Old Testament scriptures to show that this was planned by God. Gentiles were part of God's plan all along. And then... If you know your book of Acts, the New Testament book of Acts that gives the history of the beginning of the church, Paul, in the book of Acts in chapter 9, was specifically chosen to reach Gentiles with the gospel, to reach non-Jewish people with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And <clears throat> you remember his name was changed from Saul, which is... a uh, Sort of a good Jewish name. <laughs> Saul was one of the kings of the Old Testament. His name was changed from Saul to Paul. Why was that? Why was his name changed? Because Paulus was a good Greek name. And by the way, I just found out, I just found out I was reading some archaeology stuff this week. In, the, in Turkey, Turkey archaeology, in the area that, that is called Galatia in the Bible, that after Paul preached the gospel there, a lot of people became Christians. They started naming their, they started naming their little boys, guess what? Paul. So they have all kinds of graves there of people whose first name is Paul. Isn't that fantastic? That shows the work of the gospel in that part of the world in its early history. It's just another fantastic thing to talk about. Okay, So Paul, the apostle, was given the job of letting people know that Gentile salvation was part of God's plan. And Paul talks about that in great detail in Ephesians, the third chapter. I'm trying to speak quickly because I knew I had too many overheads made for this lesson this morning. The Apostle Peter also learned that God welcomes people from every nation. And you know the story of that in Acts chapter 10 when Paul goes to, to the Roman centurion Cornelius in his household and preaches the gospel. After the first conversion of these Gentiles, Peter and other Christians became convinced that God has granted to the Gentiles also repentance that leads to life, he said in Acts chapter 11. Now this is the text where Peter went, Peter went to preach to Cornelius and his family. And it says in verse 34 this. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation... The one, the Greek says literally, the one who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Verse 43, speaking of Jesus, it says, Of him, Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Peter learned that God was not prejudiced. God is, not God is not one to show partiality. The word partiality, diacrino, means to separate, distinguish, discern, judge, decide. From Vine's expository dictionary of the New Testament. It means to be divided in one's mind about someone. I don't know about this one. I don't know about this one. His skin's not the right color. I don't know about this one, his clothes kind of stink. I don't know about this one, his hair's too long. I don't know about this one, 
He's got one of those southern accents. Sorry, southerners. I don't know. And when I say I don't know, what am I doing? What am I doing? I'm separating, distinguishing, discerning, or judging someone. You remember the individual who said, don't judge by the color of the skin, but by the character of the person. Who said that? Who said that? Martin Luther King said that, didn't he? That's right. And you know what? When he said that, where did he learn that? He learned that from right here. God is not one to show partiality. And I want to tell you, if we judge people today based upon the color of their skin, based upon, based upon their economic status, and we judge people based upon the way they smell, we judge people based upon the length of their hair, and that's it. We're not going to heaven. We're not going to be near the God who does not show partiality. I remember years ago when I was in college, there was a big fella. Bill was his name. And Bill uh, played a great harmonica. He was from Colorado. And he was, he was thumbing rides in Colorado. He, he, he played in a band. <laughs> And he was thumbing rides, probably long hair, and he's on, he's on the highway thumbing rides, and a preacher picked him up and taught him the gospel, and he became a Christian, and then he became a preacher. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? What if that preacher said, no, his hair's too long, I'm not going to pick him up today. God does not show partiality. Well... Gentile salvation was in God's plan. Jesus purchased, the book of Revelation says, Jesus purchased with his blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, Revelation 5 says. And chapter 7 says that heaven will be filled with countless numbers of people from every nation and all the tribes and peoples and tongues. I want to tell you, if we can't get along well with people here, I don't think we're going to be getting along well with people in heaven because we're not going to be in heaven. I love this text of Galatians. In chapter, chapter th- 3 of Galatians, Verse 26, Paul says that we're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized in Christ, have put on Christ. And he goes on in this text and he says this, There is neither in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. That is, we are beneficiaries of that promise made in Genesis 12. You are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. In the family of God we are, where everyone is a child of God, where everyone is equally valuable and equally important, and everyone belongs to Christ, as the text says, and everyone inherits. Praise God. For such a family as this. That's the lesson this morning. So in the Lord's Supper, we remember that yes, Jesus died for everyone. Everyone. For the sins of the world. And the blessed gospel is for all. You remember that song? The blessed gospel is for all. Where sin is gone, must go His grace. The gospel is for all. And we gather together as God's family to eat together as one, remembering His body and blood. And as God's family, we share joys 
and we share sorrows. We share difficulties and trials. We share moving furniture, right? <laughs> Just as we now share in the Lord's Supper.